Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this morning's study, a new week, and we're continuing to look at the present truth application of some of these verses here in Daniel chapter 11. And we, we finished off with Daniel 11, verse 29. We're going to look at it again. Uh, so before we begin, can we invite God's presence into our meeting? Uh, dear Father in heaven, we are grateful that we can be here once again and uh, that you've given us this task of studying your word together, of sharing uh, the things that you are doing in in revealing to us light and helping us in our day-to-day struggles. And we pray for one another. We pray for the people that we talk to in various ways, sometimes on the internet, sometimes in person. And uh, we pray for one another. We pray for Dwight, that you can be with him in his trials right now be with his mother. We ask, Lord, that uh, uh, you can watch over those that we care about and love. We know we live in this world of sin and suffering, that this is not our home. And so we just ask, Lord, that as ambassadors of Christ, that we can represent you. We ask for your Holy Spirit to open to us the understanding of your word, that it can encourage and strengthen us in this battle. Be with each person again, we pray, and be with us together. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again. And uh, if you remember, Thursday morning, we had uh, looked at verse 29. And in verse 29, we had, we're addressing this issue about the former and the latter and, and how this should be translated. So, I mean, in in a sense, we're not looking at the present truth application of this verse. And I'm not even sure that we need a present truth application of this verse, though there may be one. We could probably relate it to November 11th, uh, uh, 2019. But let's, let's go over this again. So what we have is we have verse 27 and 28 is going to be zooming in to like in the original historical application, zooming into this treaty or agreement between Octavian and Antony. So they shall speak lies at one table. Now, we know before that, in verse 25 and 26, it's going to be addressing um, the fall of Egypt, right? So this battle between the king of the north and the king of the south. And... And this becomes this battle of Actium. It becomes a type of what's going to happen at the end of the world, right? So it's going to, it's going to typify our history, the king of the north defeating the king of the south, the battle of Actium and, and of course, the fall of Egypt in 30 AD. So we can see that parallel. We put in the present truth application, the United States and the papacy against the USSR and And that's basically Daniel chapter 11, verse 40 and and onward, at least part of it, right? And then we have this this, uh, zoom back, right, to this this league. And even though it zooms back, in the present truth application, it's going to be addressing 9-11 all the way uh, to the end of the 2030 agenda, right? So so it's showing that this, this... Spiritualistic a- application. This, this is atheism, um, represented by the King of the South, shows that at some point, and, and we just have the 2030 agenda. That is something that we didn't create. This is something that's being pushed by the UN. And there's a lot, lot more details that we looked at regarding these spans of time and the connection with the UN, but I'm not going to go into those details at the moment. And then it talks about this repetition for, for yet, the end shall be at the time appointed. So this is saying that what happens in 1798 is the end of the prophetic periods, but that's going to be repeated, right? That's the word yet, which is an iteration. And then shall he, the king of the north, return into his land with great riches and his papal Rome's heart, or pagan Rome's heart, pardon me, which we apply to papal Rome, shall be against the Holy Covenant. So it's going to talk about the persecution of Christians in that period, and then he shall do and return to his own land. And so um, that's the end of that period of time that deals with the fall 
of Rome. And then verse 29 follows. So at the time appointed, now we say the time appointed is this repeat of history. So the time appointed here is not 1798, but 1989, November 9th, 1989. And he, the papacy, and the USA, the king of the north. So this, this isn't in red. That is, we're not taking uh, this verse and looking at a historical application and then applying you know, 1989 as a present truth application. We're saying that in Daniel chapter 11, verse 29, that when it's talking about the time appointed, it is actually referring to the repeat of what happens at the end of the prophetic periods. That is that period from 1798 to 1844, the time of the end and the time appointed is this period of time, 45, 46 years, however you want to think of it. And that, here, this is saying that this is going to happen again, right? So the papacy in the USA, the king of the north, are Daniel 11, verse 40b, right? The other one was Daniel 11, verse 40a. This is Daniel 11, verse 40b. So he's going to come, he shall return, right, and come toward the south. So that means the king of the north is going to come against the king of the south, but it shall not be as the former. So we have this interpretation. It could be not, not be as the former, that is the fall of Egypt in 30 BC, or as the latter, that is the fall of Western Rome from 410 to 476. Right. So that was initially how we looked at this. Okay. But we also then said, well, it could be that the, the former says, so, so shall, shall not be as the former. Well, that's the fall of Egypt in 30 BC or the latter 1798. So it's so because we know that one of these things is going to repeat. And, and the thing is, we had no problem saying, well, it shall not be as the former because the former had to do with literal king of the north and literal king of the south. But we're saying that here what happens is is not about literal. It's about spiritual. And then the latter, in this case, instead of being the fall of Western Rome, would be just that first time appointed that was talked about earlier that we mark as 1798. So, so that was another option. And then we have a third option. So in this one, it says at the time appointed, talking about 1989, he, the papacy in the USA, the king of the north, shall return and come towards the south, the USSR. So that's all the same. But we take a different translation of the Hebrew. And if I was going to translate the Hebrew, I would have translated it this way. But the latter shall not be as the former. And, and many translations translate it this way. So from what I look at, you know, it's roughly, I wouldn't say it's half and half, but it's pretty close to how this is translated. I mean, it depends on on how many different translations you look at. But it's it sort of kind of, I would say, it's somewhat a toss-up in how it's translated. Uh, and one of the translations uh, that translates it this way um, is an early translation. So it's not like uh, this is some modern translation of the text, because if we look at uh, the Bishop's Bible, which predates the King James, at the time appointed, he shall come again and go toward the south, but the last shall not be as the first. So that's the way that I would have translated the Hebrew. So the latter shall not be as the former, or the last shall not be as the first. And, and if that's the case, then we're saying that this time appointed is, is referring to 1989. That's the last or the latter. And the former would be 1798. So you've had a few days to think about it. Now, uh, now Kelly Ross brought up something about it, and and I can't remember now what he said uh, because he brought it up in in the other study. I think Friday night, if I remember. Uh, but I didn't I didn't think it was relevant to talk about it at that time. When, whenever whatever study was, it maybe it was yesterday. But anyway, he brought this up about this verse and, and I didn't quite fully understand what he was saying. So maybe I should have listened more carefully. 
But anyway, is there any comments about these three different choices? Which 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 is the correct one? Now, one option is that all three of them are true. So that's the other thing. So we could put here this. So so I have a point. Okay, good. <laughs> so you're saying it shall not be as the former or the latter. Now, if you're going to apply it, so just so you're saying it, it's not like the former or the latter because it's a spiritual application. Okay, so the, literal. Yeah, so the former is, so if we're comparing it to the Battle of Acti, where we have the actual king of the north, king of the south, it, it says it shall not be as the former, right? So we're saying, well, the former, that would be the fall of Egypt. So the latter must be the other thing that's going to be talked about next, which is the fall of Western Rome. Now, we know it's not like the fall of Egypt in that it's it's not about literal, it's about spiritual. Then the question was, well, or as the latter. Now, is it just the same thing? It's just like neither the former or the latter are dealing with uh, literal or, 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 you know, that, I mean, they're dealing with literal, but we're, it's like those, but it's spiritual in both cases. It could be the same thing. Um, so we did, we need to kind of, uh, put that in here, I guess. So the fall of Egypt in 30 BC, um, in that it is spiritual north and south and not literal, right? That makes sense. Or as the latter, which which is the word latter means Western, that is the fall of Western Rome. But here in this case, I don't see that that would be the same reason. Because it's 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 talking about the former and the latter. It's it's like those. Right. It's like both of those events. But in what way is it not like the latter? Is it just that? It's the spiritual, spiritual Rome, pagan Rome, instead of papal Rome. I mean, maybe that's a possibility, right? That it's just saying, so I would put here in that it is not pagan, literal Rome, but papal, spiritual Rome. Okay. So. And it's spelled a little wrong. So, so that's one possibility. Uh, so, what do you say about that, Stephen? And any thoughts about what I put in there? I don't hear you. So, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I just have to sort of review it again. Listen over. It's just yeah. Sort of... <laughs> yeah. So. So the first thing is, you know, we say at the time appointed here is 1989. We're saying it's Daniel 11 verse 40b rather than Daniel 11 verse 40a as the first time when it talks about, uh, you know, where it talks about the end. And that's going to be what in verse 27, where it's going to say, um, um, oh, yeah. So that's going to be in verse, yeah, the end of verse 27 for yet. Uh, the end shall be at the time appointed, right? So we're saying that that end and the time appointed, the end technically is 1798. The time appointed is really the Moed, right? The the end of the prophetic period is October 22, 1844, the Day of Atonement. Um, so in this historical application, it's referring us to Daniel 11, verse 40a, but it uses that word yet, which means that this is going to be repeated. That that's why I, I that word yet, which means an iteration. Yet the end will be repeated at the time appointed. So so it's saying that this time appointed year 1798 to 1844, and that's going to be repeated. And then it goes back to this says, then shall he, the king of the north, return into his land with great riches, and his Pagan Rome's heart shall be against the Holy Covenant. So it's talking about this persecution that's going to happen against Christians, right? And then he shall do exploits, that's persecution, and return to his own land, right? So it's, it's this, this history. 
basically there's two different events uh, that are being discussed here. One is the, the Battle of Actium and, and those things connected with it, and that typifies uh, the time of the end, and and also the fall of, of Rome and what happens with the persecution of Christians and so forth. That's going to typify the time of the end. So then when we get to verse 29, it's going to talk about at the time appointed. Now, we could have taken the position, which we didn't, and I didn't put that as an option here. We could have just say, well, at the time appointed, that's going to be 1798. But the reason that we, we didn't is because it's going to be the king of the north coming against the king of the south. And, and that's not 1798. That's 1989. Now, we could have put 1798 there. But, but the problem would be, it says, because it's talking about the king of the north coming against the king of the south. That's definitely 1989. So when it says, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter, right? But it shall not be as the former or as the latter. Then we'd have to say, okay, well, well, maybe it was talking about like 1798 is not going to be like the fall of act, the battle of Actium. And then it's not going to be like, um, the fall of, of Western Rome. This is the fall of papal Rome. And, and that is a possibility. Like, you know, I wouldn't necessarily take that off the table, but because of the context here dealing with the king of the north and the king of the south. And the fact that we do have Daniel 11 for 40 that has this two times at the end. To me, the clearest way would to take that this time appointed is the repeated one where the king of the north comes against the king of the south. And the way that it's not like the battle of Actium is that it's spiritual, not literal. And then we had trouble trying to figure out, well, well, how is it not like the latter, the fall of Western Rome? Well, that is, we could say, well, it's it's not pagan Rome, it's papal Rome. So so that would work. So there's nothing wrong with this interpretation of the text. And and now the fall of Western Rome is going to come next in verse 30. Right. So that means it would be pointing to an event uh, that it hasn't yet addressed specifically the details of, of it. But this is pretty common where it will mention something and then it will describe it again in more detail right so there's it's not like they have to mention the fall of western Rome first because this is going to then be the latter if that's the interpretation of that text so that that one makes sense right right Stephen, you can see how that would work oh, and Stephen disappeared so <clears throat> he got disconnected a- anybody else on the, on this so, so this choice, Daniel 11, verse 29, as the, the former and the latter, spiritual, literal, pagan, and papal. So it's still literal and spiritual in a sense. Um, welcome back. Steve. Yeah, just, yeah, just, uh, grab the phone. I just must have hit the wrong button. <laughs> yeah. So okay. Right off. Okay. But this, this, uh, this yeah. first interpretation, what do you think? Yeah, I suppose. I don't know. I just kind of find it hard to follow. We've I'll say I've been looking at the computer too much. <laughs> I'm just not thinking for okay. clearly at the moment, you know. So okay. yeah. Okay. So, so it's hard to kind of grasp it in your mind. You're saying uh, at the moment, just where I am, I'm trying to sort of do jobs here at the moment as well. I'm kind of okay. Uh, I just I can't really. My brain brain capacity not functioning as <laughs> hundred percent. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, that's fair enough. Okay. So, but, but the idea here, it just to kind of, you know, simplify it further is that we can see that whatever the time of the end that's referred to here, it's going to be spiritual powers, not literal powers. That is, it's, it's not going to be the symbols that are being used, you know, king of the north, king of the south, uh, you know, the fact that we're dealing with pagan Rome. Well, in this history, even if it's 1798, right, rather than 1989 that's being discussed, and, and maybe maybe it's sort of both in some ways, but we're not dealing with the literal king of the north and the literal king of the south. 
that people often are insisting on. Right? They're saying, well, the king of the north, you know, must be Turkey. The king of the south must be Egypt. Because that's what they represent. And and I've had this discussion with people, um, you know, especially over things like the River Euphrates. They want to take the River Euphrates literally. Uh, there's a group of people who, you know, use the charts and, and profess to believe in William Miller and things like that. Well, they use the 1843 chart. I'm not sure if they use the 1850 chart, the one group. So they, they, they want to be Millerites. I and think, PG, I think PG Temple started to believe that, you know, PG Temple. Pat? Yeah, the one that came out with the Daniel Revelation book. Yeah, that's yeah, Pat Temple. That's Roland's mom. Yeah, so yeah, so probably that would make sense kind of where she was coming from the last time I talked to her. Um, but yeah, a lot of people are, are going in this sort of direction. And, but it's pretty clear that, you know, if you're dealing with the River Euphrates, the River Euphrates is a symbol and, and so I asked them a simple question. Is Babylon literal? Is it talking about Iraq? Or is it talking about the papacy in the book of Revelation? And, and I haven't had anybody say, yeah, it's talking about Iraq. So they're mixing literal and spiritual. They're saying, well, the Euphrates is referring to the literal Euphrates. There's only one Euphrates. And I said, well, isn't there a spiritual Euphrates? You know, you could say there's only one Babylon, and I have a hard time, you know, in communicating with them because it's just they say, well, we're following William Miller, right? We're we're we're, we're following the pioneers, whatever they said, and and there isn't really a, a unified agreement in the pioneers. It's not like the pioneers had only one view about these types of things. They had multiple different views. So it depends which pioneer you're going to be talking about. But but the point is, you're not going to be dealing with literal king of the north, king of the south in 1798. And especially in the present time. I mean, we're not looking for, we're not looking to literal Jerusalem. We're not watching what's happening in Jerusalem. We're not keeping our eye on Palestine, you know. To, so, uh, so dear Lord. Yeah. You you saying that the little that Euphrates drying up right now is just is it is it's it's normal, right? Well, it's nothing to do with Bible prophecy. Well, that's what I was thinking too. But yeah. I'm just saying, I'm just saying it's spiritual. It's not little, right? So, and and it's also during the sixth plague. You know, it's after the close of probation. And and if you read it in the context of the spirit of prophecy and the great controversy, um, I mean, she puts it in the sixth plague. She puts it at the time that we're going to have Satan's personation of Christ and that we're going to have the time of Jacob's trouble. She quotes the three unclean clean spirits like frogs, you know, going forth. And she connects it to Satan's personation of Christ after the close of probation. I mean, it, it's, it's so clear in the great controversy. I, I've never understood why people have trouble with it. But what people will tell me is, well, Ellen White's just jumping around. None of it's chronological. And it's very chronological. She's she's going through chronologically what happens in the final chapters of the Great Controversy. She's not jumping around to some time prior to the close of probation for Satan's personation of Christ. It's, It's the crowning act in his deception. And it happens at a time when the papacy loses its support. Right. So we have, you know, the Sunday law, we we have the close of probation, and we have, you know, finally the wicked, they start to turn against their leaders, right? And at that point, Satan's going to come and personate Christ. And this is to deceive, if possible, the very elect. And that is a rhetorical sort of statement. It's not possible to deceive the very elect. If Satan could deceive the very elect after probation has closed, he would have been victorious and the whole plan of salvation would fall apart because God would have declared as righteous people that aren't righteous. So if if Satan could deceive even one of the very elect, then Satan is victorious. And it's going to be during the time of Jacob's trouble that he's going to have this power. Now, this power is actually to the point that the, the righteous it will appear to them 
as if they are the scourge of the earth, as if they are the cause of all these things, right? So to appearances, it will seem that Satan is right, that the world is right, that this, this false Christ is real to appearances. But they don't go by appearances. They go by God's word and they just throw themselves upon the mercy of God. They don't see that they're this victorious, wonderful people, just as Jesus, when he was in the wilderness, tempted for 40 days and 40 nights, when Satan came to him and says, if thou be the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Well, Christ there, it appeared that he was not the son of God. It appeared, you know, he, he Ellen White says, you know, he insinuates, well, maybe you're this fallen angel. You know, maybe you're self-deceived. Uh, can you show me that you, you are the son of God? But 40 days before, his father had said, you know, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And and it's upon that word he rested. He didn't focus upon what he saw, what he felt, what what the appearance was. He just trusted in his father in his father's word. And so he quotes from Deuteronomy, man shall not live by bread alone, the things that you can feel and touch and see and taste and smell, right? But by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So that's what he trusted in, God's word. So anyway, the point is, when we when we look at this literal and spiritual, when people are trying to take You know, what's happening in Iraq or what happens in Israel or what's happening like the river Euphrates drying up because, you know, they're doing so much irrigation. They're taking so much water out of the Euphrates and it's starting to dry up. You know, it happens certain times of the year. But somehow that that is a prophetic sign. They're not understanding the rules of Bible prophecy. They're not using Miller's rules. So you, you can't have the king of the north be Islam or anything like that. And, and so you got some people with the king of the north is, is Islam and some people have the king of the south is Islam. Um, different, different groups on how they're trying to interpret, you know, these literal applications. And, and we're not doing that. We're looking at what happens historically and we're applying it. But here, this is clearly telling us that there is going to be a repetition of the time appointed. And, and that this repetition of the time appointed, it, it's it's a parallel to what happens in 1790. So it's the same in lots of ways. But unlike the examples that are being used, the battle, the battle of Actium, the fall of Egypt, or the fall of Western Rome, that it's paralleling itself to. So the time of the end, the time appointed is paralleling itself to the time of the end of these different kingdoms king of the north and the king of the south it it's going to be like those but it's not going to be like them in some ways and that is it's going to be talking about spiritual not literal so that's one way of interpreting daniel 11 verse 29 now we have another way in which we could interpret this and this is very similar so in this one we're still going to have 1989 november 9th 1989 as the time appointed this repetition of the history from 1798 uh, to uh, 1844. And and that's going to be the papacy. Uh, When we look at the other problem, and I put and or, that is, we are taking the position that maybe there are more than one way into interpretive verse. And we've done this in other places, especially dealing with with the Battle of Actium, right? That... uh, uh, even for a time. So we, you know, from the, from the fortress or against the fort, the fortresses, against the strongholds or from the strongholds. So, so we had two different interpretations. We accepted both of them. So now we have another one. And so this one would say at the time appointed 1989, uh, the papacy in the United States shall return and come towards the king of the south, but it shall not be as the former. So the fall of Egypt, uh, but just here, the latter would be um, 1798. And so we would still have the same idea. 
that it's not spiritual. So we would say here the same thing. I'm just going to copy this, uh, copy this part and put it in there. So that's not going to be any different, the first part. Um, so it's, I'm just going to add this, I guess. And then, but in the latter in 1798, the simple thing would be, and for some reason I lost the, the Hebrew number here, which I think I need to, should put that in, even though it's in the one above. So it's just, it's the North coming against the South and not the South coming against the North, right? So that means in 1989 is not like 1798. So that's, that's another way. And, and I don't really have problems with that one. It's just that the latter isn't going to be what's coming next, the fall of Western Rome. It's not going to be um, what's referred to as the latter. So it's obviously the fall of Western Rome is, is coming. It's not mentioning this in verse 29, if we do it that way. And, and so, so I have nothing wrong with that interpretation. So to me, both of these would be valid, the, the first and the second. Now we have a third, and this is based upon a different translation of the Hebrew. And again, this is how I would translate the Hebrew if I was uh, the translator. So again, we got to put in that, uh, I got rid of. So here we would just say the latter is 1989 and the former is 1798. So this is simple. Uh, it, and, and this would be, of course, 1989 shall not be as the, the latter shall not be as the former. And again, the north and south are reversed. So that's the way in which these are different. Because in the former, if that's 1798, it's the king of the south defeating the king of the north. The latter is the king of the north defeating the king of the south. So it's just a reversal. Now, that's that's actually my the one I would prefer, just because I think that's what the Hebrew is saying. Though the other is a possible translation of the Hebrew. Both, both could uh, be a valid translation. I just think this translation uh, makes more sense, that the latter shall not be as the former. It, it just seems much more natural, especially in the context of what it's talking about. The other one's a little bit more uh, problematic or obscure. But, but I think all three are valid. So I don't have a problem with putting and or. Now, I'm going to put this other one in this one that we talked about that, that I had left out. And, and I'm just going to call this an or, but that is, it's in opposition to all of these other ones. Um, and the reason why it's an or is that I don't think that this could be true and the other one's also true. And, and this or is, so in this one, we're going to put the time appointed 1798. So we just say it's just talking about at the time appointed, not the one in 1989. And it's going to say at the time appointed, the papacy and the USA, the king of the North shall return and come towards the south. Now, the problem here is that doesn't happen in 1798. And so what I would have to put in here to make this work is... I'd have to put, that is, it shall not be as the former, the fall of Egypt in 30, um, in 30 BC is that it's spiritual north and south, or as the latter in that it is the north against the south and not the south as the north. So all this is, um, so let me see here. Um, so it, it have to be the other way around. So it's not the, yeah, not the north, it's the south against, so it's be the other way, that it is, is not the north against the south. But, so the, the problem here, let me see here, so, or as the latter. Well, see, the latter here, so this would not be 1798. So we'd have to say the latter. And in this case, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how you'd make this work. I think that's why I didn't like this one. Because the former here, if, if the latter is the fall of Western Rome, you wouldn't you wouldn't really say that. So maybe what I would say uh, I would do I'd actually do it this way. So the former is going to be the fall of Egypt in 30 BC, and and in this case I would just simply uh, put this one here, 
in that it is not the north against the south, but the south against the north, or as the latter, which is the fall of Western Rome, in that it is, okay, so in this case, it's comparing 1798 to the fall of Egypt and to the fall of Western Rome. So 1798 is the time of the end or the time appointed. And, and, you know, we could put 1798 to 1844, but we'll just leave it as 1798 at the time appointed. Um, and in this case, it's, um, it's not the papacy in the USA. It's just the papacy. But see, and, and then here you have this problem, right? So you can see the problem here is that it's, it's not that way, right? So we don't have the king of the north shall return and come towards the king of the south, France. It's actually kind of the opposite. So that's why I say it's a hard, hard to put this as 1798. You understand what I'm saying? So that's why I don't put 1798. I don't think this one is good, but I'm, I'm putting it here and then just crossing it out because I don't think it works. But I just wanted to put it there as, as an example to show how I don't think that 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 actually works as an interpretation. Because why would you say it's the king of the north coming against the king of the south, but it's not going to be like that, it's going to be reversed? It doesn't make any sense. So it's just it's just a way of eliminating that possibility. And so if this was true, that it's talking about 1798, I'm not sure how it could be talking about that, because we don't have uh, the king of the north coming against France. We have France coming against the king of the north, defeating them. Now, we have abandoned, of course, all of the traditional interpretations of this verse. And, but I think we have to. I don't think that those uh, would make sense. And we looked at that. It just it just didn't didn't work at all. That this time of point to this time of the end can't be referring to the end of the, the 360 years. It must be referring to the time of the end, right? That is Daniel 11, verse 40. So the time of the end, the time appointed, refers to 1798 and also so to 1989. It's it's basically just a shorthand for Daniel 11, verse 40, which is going to come later. Daniel 11, verse 40, it's leading up to it. The other thing that we see in this understanding of these passages is we, we see a more consistent narrative as we move through Daniel chapter 11. We can see where the story is going and we can see why, what the context is. The context is the previous prophecies in the book of Daniel being expanded on, ex- especially the fact that we, we, he already understands the 70 weeks and he already understands the 2300 days. What he doesn't fully understand is the connection of some of these prophecies to the time of the end. What that means. Millerite history is still not fully understood with those other visions. And so Daniel 10, 11, and 12 are going to give us Millerite history. And, and they're going to show how we move from, from the this history of what was happening with literal Israel, how we're going to move through these kingdoms that are talked about in the first parts of the book of Daniel and how we're going to move to this time of the end. And and we see that when we get to chapter 12, you know, we have, you know, it's going to lead us all the way up to the close of probation, but then it's going to go back and it's going to show us Millerite history. And we're going to see the same thing in Revelation, right? So it ties Daniel and Revelation together. So um, so I'm happy to say that I believe that all three interpretations here that we have of this verse are valid and true, that it's not one or the other or two of them or, you know, or one or just one of them has to be right. I'm saying that all three interpretations tell the truth that they are consistent. And and so there isn't one. If I was going to prefer one, I would prefer the last one. But the other ones are completely valid. So I don't know what people think about that. Can God do this? Can he take one verse and have it mean 
three different but related things that tell us the same thing, but in a different way? Well, you can take one word and it can mean different things. So I, I would assume you could do the same with um, that. Yeah, it's, and symbols have more than one meaning, right? And we already have precedents with the Battle of Actium with it and and um, the other battle, the Battle of Pharsalus. That both of those are going to be marking uh, even for a time. One ending with the, the Battle of Pharsalus ending 360 years ends with... Uh, the what's it called the something of Milan the end of persecution and the other one with the time the battle of Actium then to uh, the movement of the capital from Rome to Constantinople so we have a verse that has uh, two different meanings yeah edict is the word you're looking for do I think what I I was saying edict of Milan oh edict of Milan yes yeah, the Edict of Milan. I knew, I knew it was some kind of decree or something, but I knew decree was wrong. Edict, yeah. So the Edict of Milan. So, But the point is, here we have a verse, and we have three interpretations of that verse, and they're all consistent with what we understand. And that is, all three interpretations are correct. Is that possible? Because they're not contradicting each other. I mean, do we think God is smart enough to be able to do that? I mean, obviously, that's a rhetorical question. But it is, is it consistent that God would do that? Just like you mentioned, er, so you mentioned earlier, things have more than one meaning. Yeah. Okay. Because I'm going to take this position personally, whether whether other people t- take it or not, that, that it's not a matter of choosing between one of these three. It's that, that all three are correct. And they give us information that is consistent with the narrative that we have here, even though I prefer the last one, because I think that's what the Hebrew actually says, but the latter shall not be as the former. And then uh, we can see quite clearly how it's not, that that is the north and south are reversed, but that they are basically the time of the end. And, and so the time of the end in 1798, being uh, the former, you know, or um, and and 1989 being the latter. That is, this is describing Daniel 11 verse 40, right? Now, so then it's going to give us the fall of Western Rome, right? And of course, the reason why I had the uh, the latter is being the fall of Western Rome, because we're going to have you know the ships of Kittim. You know, shall come against him, therefore he shall be grieved, right? What happens there from 410 to, uh, you know, 476, I guess. But it's going to deal with that that history really up until the 6th century, right? Them having intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant, that is apostate Christianity. So this this leads quite clearly into what happens with the baptism of Clovis on December 25th, 508. And so everything else flows from that so nicely that, you know, we now have this, this rise of the papacy and, and then we're going to see its end, right? In verse 40. So it's, it's already told us about that. It's going to now parallel the fall of Western Rome with the fall of papal Rome or the other way around the fall of papal Rome. It's papal Rome. It's going to parallel it with the fall of Western Rome. So it's going to give us this fall of Western Rome, Western Rome, the rise of papal Rome. But it's going to show that that it's going to be papal Rome is going to be defeated by the king of the south. The same power that put it on the throne of the earth, France, is going to take it off the throne of the earth. Now, I had this other discussion with uh, James Prest. I don't know how many of you have run into him on Facebook and or other places, but um, so he was trying to argue that that the papacy never actually receives a mortal wound or a deadly wound, that it doesn't actually die. Now, there's kind of a truth to that, but we know that the United States rises as the power in 1798 and that this is the days of one king, right? And at the end of the days of one king, we then have the United Nations uh, come in, right? 
And now he says, well, the papacy never really, really dies. And so he tries to take in, uh, let's go there just briefly. And I know I talked about this before, but I want to go over it again because uh, I think it's an, a really important point. So Papacy in Daniel 8, the, what's that? Papacy's political influence dies. Yes. Now, so uh, here, dies. Yeah, right. So the political influence dies. And and that's that's the point is is that its deadly wound has to do with its power being diminished, right? But it's going to be resurrected at the end. So you know it is a resurrection. The idea of a mortal wound is or a deadly wound is that it actually causes the death. He's not just wounded, right? He's wounded unto death. That means like if you receive a mortal wound, you die. Because if you didn't die, it wasn't a mortal wound, right? It was just a wound. It doesn't matter how long it takes you to die. But if you if you get shot and you die, you received a mortal wound. If you get shot and you don't die, you didn't receive a mortal wound. And that's the idea that's in the Greek, right? So <clears throat> it's, that it's a wound that causes your death. And that is what this head received, right? One of the heads was wounded unto death, okay? Received a mortal wound or a deadly wound. Okay, but anyway, let's go here. So he tries to make an argument that because he doesn't accept the 2520, uh, he can't understand this question and answer in Daniel 8.13 and 8.14, right? So it says, then I heard one saint speaking and another saint said unto that certain saint. So the certain saint we know is Palmona, which spake. So so we have one saint is speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint, which spake, how long shall be the vision concerning the day and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? So this question is being asked to Palmona, right? The wonderful number. That's Christ. He's going to be asked this question. And we understand that the daily refers to 1260 years of paganism and the transgression of desolation, 1200 years of papalism uh, to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. And then we have this answer unto 2300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Well, what it's saying is that this is going to continue until the Moab, right, until the time appointed, because the cleansing of the sanctuary is the time appointed, right? And then we have in verse 19, and he said, behold, I will make thee know what shall be at the last end of the indignation, for at the time appointed, the end shall be. The last end of the indignation comes after the first end, right? So the first end of the indignation is the daily. The last end of the indignation is the transgression of desolation. So it's pointing to that history, not to the specific date. That is, we know that the 1260 days or years, 42 months, or time, times and a half, don't end on October 22nd, 1844. They're going to end February 15th, 1798. But that's still part of the same period. That's the time appointed. At the time appointed, the end shall be. Right. That is this time appointed October. The hour of God's judgment is come. Right. That is true in 1798. And it's not that the hour of God's judgment is coming, you know, in 45 or 46 years. The time of the end marks the beginning of the hour of God's judgment, because prior to the day of atonement. There is a three step testing prophetic message that has to be proclaimed, this warning message to prepare people for the close of probation, right? To prepare them for the day of judgment. And, and one of the things we see is, is the trumpets. You know, uh, Rosh Hashanah. Is Rosh Hashanah, you know, it's the first day of the seventh month. It's the beginning of the civil year. It's where you get the, the feast of trumpets. Well, we can see that the trumpets have been marking for a long time, this announcement that the judgment is coming, the day of atonement is coming. 
So what he tries to argue, what James Press tries to argue is that, well, that the transgression of desolation doesn't end until the end of the Day of Atonement. Right. He says, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And he puts the ED in the word cleansed in capitals and say, see, it's past tense. Now, but he agrees that the 2300 days mark the beginning of the cleansing of the sanctuary. But he wants to, he thinks that the trotting underfoot must end after the sanctuary is cleansed. But we know from looking at Revelation chapter 11. Right. In verse two, but the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. And he shall give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days. So we know that forty and two months is the twelve hundred and sixty years, and the treading ends at the at the end of those twelve hundred and sixty days, right? If he's going to tread the holy city. 42 months, right? And of course, that is uh, in verse 13, to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. It's obviously the same per- uh, period, the same event, the trotting or the treading, same thing. Those end in 1798. So I, I, I don't understand the argument that, that people have. But, but I, I bring this up because when we look at Daniel chapter 11, it's expanding on this. When it addresses this uh, at the time of the end, you know, at the, at the last end of the, of the indignation or at the, at the time appointed, the end shall be at the last end of the indignation. Right. We can see that Daniel 11 is addressing that very idea in verse 27. For yet the end shall be at the time appointed. He's telling you the same thing. And. In verse 29, at the time appointed, he shall return and come towards the south. So so we know uh, the time appointed at the end, 1798, that, that, that it is referring to uh, the king of the south coming against the king of the north, right? But in our history, it's the king of the north coming against the king of the south. So it's it's all built in here. There's this, this natural flow of ideas as we go through the book of Daniel of why things are being said when they're being said and how they're being said that it's it's building upon this theme and this is the repeat and enlarge of of biblical prophecy and of how the Jews how the Bible's written right so it make it makes perfect sense now if we were just to take our view that we've had before that, you know, Daniel 11 verse 40 just kind of pops out of nowhere. I'm not, I'm not saying that that, you know, maybe it's a little bit um, overly dramatic. I mean, because we can see this. But but all of a sudden you have the king of the south pushing at the king of the north and the king of the north coming against him. You have this one verse that's going to describe 1798 and 1989. And we say, well, you know, that's just what happens. It, but the thing is. If we understand that these have already been referred to, then you can see how verse 40 comes from verse 29 and that from verse 30 to 31 or 39, 30 to 39, you have then just the description of first the fall of Western Rome, the rise of the papacy, the characteristics of the papacy. And then you can see that verse 40 naturally flows from that description that we've already had, that these aren't sort of disjointed events in Greek and pagan Roman history, that that they're actually answering to something. And, And we know that the hymn here then has to be this hymn that is described in this whole history, that the hymn can't be changed from... Uh, pagan Rome to France, right? So, so this natural flow then is interrupted if all of a sudden we bring France in as this power that's going to come against Turkey and against um, uh, Egypt, right? Yeah, it just kind of breaks it apart. Yeah, and and then you know, 
And did I say that right? I always get this mixed up because I don't quite understand it. I, I mean, I understand it. So, so here at the time of the end, Egypt's going to push at France, right? So the him is going to be this atheistic power, France. And Turkey's going to push, push against him. But do we have anything here about the Pope being taken captive in that interpretation? If we have that there are three powers here, Turkey, France, and Egypt, is the time of the end here addressing the Pope being taken captive in 1798? You mean if there's... They're saying it was Turkey, you're saying? So so what Uriah Smith says, and this is from Alexander Keith, and, and Josiah Litch it, um, iterates it as well. You know, so he has the same view. They say that when it says at the time of the end, so they're going to mark the time of the end, 1798, but they're not going to have this verse describing anything about the papacy. Uh, the That's king of the that. south is going to push at him. The him... <laughs> is, in their view, this king that's introduced in verse 36, the king that shall do according to his will. They believe to be France, right? This is atheistic France. He shall exalt himself, magnify himself above every god, even though this is the language in Second Thessalonians that was referring to the man of sin, to the papacy, right? But they're going to apply this now to France because they say this is an atheistic power, Right? And so when they get to verse 40, and at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him? They're saying Egypt's going to push at the king of the south. Or, or pardon me, at France, right? So Egypt's the king of the south. It's going to push at France. And then the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, with horsemen, with many ships. And he shall enter into the country, shall overflow and pass over. And so this is supposed to be Turkey, because Turkey's the king of the north, coming against France. And that doesn't really describe anything of what happened historically i mean this is an overwhelming uh symbol this overflowing and passing over sure you know napoleon's armies ran into uh battles in egypt and battles in syria and turkey but that that doesn't describe it but it also doesn't describe anything about the pope being ca taken captive that leaves it out right that's the rome establishes a vision yes so, so, so there's so many problems with this interpretation, but this is an interpretation that's being pushed. I mean, we're going to see it being pushed with people who are anti-Trinitarian. Um, we're going to, you know, they, they're going to be people using the charts, at least the 1840. Some of them use the 1850 and 1843 chart. Um, so some use the 1843 chart only. You know, they want to be Millerites. They want to follow the pioneers. So they're rejecting really a lot of light. I'm not sure why they still believe in the Sabbath and the sanctuary, but, you know, they're Seventh-day Adventists who are going back to the foundation. Um, and a lot of it has to do with Jeff initially doing that. So a lot of these are sort of offshoots of this movement. That is, uh, we had these different groups that came and left in 2014. They came in earlier, left in 2014. They sort of fractured. Some of the people are were people connected with that, those movements, those groups who have now formed their other groups. And, and so we have a movement just like in, in Millerite history after October 22nd, 1844. Right, you, have all, you have all these different people that are Adventists. You got the people who become, well, the age to come people. They're going to become Jehovah's Witnesses. So you got, you know, Barber and then uh, you know, and then you're going to have Charles Taze Russell, who's a follower of Barber, right? Um, you have, of course, the First Day Adventists, you know, FFA, right? You have, um, you know, all of these different groups, offshoots, sort of vying for this territory. And, and these, those are symbols of what, what is happening now. And the question is, you know, what group is holding on to the truth that was given but also receiving light from that truth that makes that light shine brighter. And, and so the inconsistencies that we see, and, you know, and I have nothing against Jeff as a person. I love him and, uh, and, and Clayton and, and, and others, right? But I just know prophetically that what Jeff is, is teaching is incorrect because I, I read the papers 
He's teaching a lot of things that he used to teach. He's teaching things that contradict what he used to teach. He's actually inconsistent within his his own uh, papers sometimes. It, it's not well thought out. It And, you know, all a person does needs to do is just spend some time reading the papers. And if you spend time reading them, you start to realize that it's it's kind of rambling. It's not really, you know, if a person writes a book, there should be a... a a natural flow of consistency. They should, what you do is you tell somebody in a book, you know, you have an introduction, you tell them what your basic ideas are and what you're going to say, right? Just like writing an essay, right? You got a paragraph that tells you what the essay is about. And introduction, you have, introduction. Yeah. And then, and then the body of an essay is going to, to just expand on what you said that you, that you were going to say, right? You're going to add more detail. And then you have a conclusion. The conclusion tells you tell people what you said, right? So you you sum it up again, just like your introduction. Right? It, it's it's how you do any presentation. You tell people what you're going to say, you say it, and then you tell them what you said. And and I don't find that in Jeff's writings. I don't find a consistent flow of ideas. Now. And, and even when we do these studies here, so we're, we're doing these studies, we're digging into God's work. You know, we don't have a plan. I mean, I, I don't know at the beginning of the study exactly what God's going to show us. But I, I like to make a summary of what has happened and why we're doing what we're doing. And then to examine it. And, you know, when, when we finally put the paper together, there's it's going to say at the beginning of the paper what what our goal was. You know what what it is we found, and then we will you know go through this these verses that we study and and write in necessary explanations for why we drew different conclusions and then you know and then sum it up at the end and then people can examine what we have done and they can say, "Well, you know I think you made a mistake here, and here's why but with with what Jeff is writing, it makes it almost impossible. For anybody to really do an analysis of what he's saying, because it's not clear. There's sort of this contradictory uh, ideas. So one is, you know, warning people about uh, Nashville. Warning Nashville was a sin, according to Jeff. But he's not going to take July 18, 2020 off the lines. He's not really going to draw the lines, but he's going to say, you know, it, it is this way mark of some sort. Not really sure what, because he doesn't really define what line it's in. But where is the parallel? And and how can something that was completely error um, be a waymark? How can it be uh, the first disappointment of William Miller? Is he saying that it's the first day of the first month? H how do we get that? Right. So 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 the whole idea here is that as we have studied, we have to believe that. That God has led Christianity from the beginning, right? We can see what happens to Christianity. Christianity apostatizes, right? We end up with, and we have an explanation for it prophetically in God's word, right? It's not like we just chose to be Christians instead of Jews, you know, because we were born in a Christian country or something like that. We can see that prophetically Christianity is true. It's doctrinally true. And then we're Seventh-day Adventists. We look at, at history, at prophecy. We look at the Millerites, and we say, well, they preached a message that was true. But we're not Millerites, right? Because Millerites had a place and a role in time and history. And, and what they presented was a message from God. Did Christ come back October 22nd, 1844? No. Were they then uh, in error? Would we then abandon uh, Millerism because they they preached uh, a wrong date? And and they had all this counsel in the scripture saying that they shouldn't time set for the second coming of Christ. And yet they did. Just as we had uh, all this in the Bible and spirit of prophecy telling us that we're not supposed to set dates for the close of probation, the Sunday law, the loud cry, the second coming, 
or any promise of special significance. And yet we did. And we did under God's direction, just as the Millerites did. And we were disappointed just as the Millerites were. And we have a first disappointment and we have a second disappointment. And, and in a way, the Millerites had more than one disappointment and uh, one first disappointment. They had lots of disappointments, right? So, I mean, we could we could take those lines and, and build them in different ways. But we have really clearly marked from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month, what we call the first disappointment and the great disappointment. And that line in history is, is very solid. Right? It has all of these things that illustrate that it's true. And, and least of which is just adding the dates together to get 187, which is, you know, the number of days from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month. Just all kinds of impossible coincidences. And the parallels with Ezekiel's uh, dates and the parallels in um, Ezra 7 to 10. Right. Just so many things. And if we're going to believe that God was not leading us, that somehow since 2012, the movement was hijacked by Jeff listening to other people. Where is that in Millerite history? What we see clearly in Millerite history is that Miller goes off track after the, the great disappointment. Jeff is Miller. Right. He, he, he fulfills that role. And it makes no sense to continue to follow Miller. Especially, you know, especially now. And then when we look at the parallel, we can see the parallel is, you know, we're in that history of 1850 still. We're in that history where all of these different movements exist within the movement itself. There's division, you have people time setting and, and James and Ellen White are republishing the views of the pioneers and accepting the light of the midnight cry. And, and we're in that history. So to be consistent is to be consistent with Seventh-day Adventist history. Staying with uh, staying with Miller's rules is. Yeah. And staying with the light that God gave us, that God led us this far to to say that, well, God wasn't leading us. I mean, the, the real problem that I have just from from a human point of view is Jeff admits that he's trusted the wrong people. That, and he believes that he misled us. Basically, he was involved in fanaticism. And he wants us to follow him still. Why would you follow someone who was caught up in fanaticism, who was deceived? What, what would give you confidence to follow him? That doesn't make any sense. There's nothing you can say, well, he's repented of his fanaticism now. Well, that would be fine. But he would not be a person to follow. Right. If that or if that's anybody, or any one person for that matter or anybody for that matter. Well, right. But but you see, the point is people just want to follow him and follow him blindly. That is, yeah, all of the light that, you know, they thought they had. Well, now they're just going to set it aside because, well, Jeff's back. And so so we were teaching all kinds of things as that we're now going to have to say we're error because Jeff just tells us they're error. So we're it's just going like to. It's not like the former. It's not like the former anymore. Right. So, you know, the question that I would have is, is, you know, if something is error, it needs to be shown that it's error from the scriptures. That is, somebody would have to come along and show how all of the things that led to July 18th, 2020 were error. Not just that nothing happened. Right. It's like Jesus didn't come back October 22nd, 1844. So I don't need to examine and explain the prophecies. I just have to say, well, nothing happened, so you were wrong, so I don't even need to consider anything that you said before, because you were just wrong. And and that's basically what's being said. You know, nothing happened July 18, 2020, so we were wrong. What what do we do with all the evidence? Especially as we've examined the foundation. We've gone back and we looked at the foundation of this movement. We saw that the, the foundation was laid solidly. We then studied the lines. We looked at them closely. And we could see that there was an explanation for our disappointment, just as the Seventh-day Adventists, you know, James and Ellen White, and those that, you know, Hiram Edson and, and people like that, uh, Crozier, others, said there is an explanation for our disappointment. You know, this was in God's providence. And, and for us, we can see 
we were completely unprepared for anything that was going to follow if our prediction had come true. We would have misrepresented God's character at every turn. Uh, we would have made the truth distasteful. We would have, we would not have been able to represent Christ. And, and that has to happen. We have to be able to represent Christ to Adventists and to the world. And the reason that we're studying is we want to understand what the truth is so that it can transform us. You know, it's easy to to be a conspiracy theorist and to see the evil that exists in the world. Lots of evil exists, but none of that makes us good. Right. Just because I can see evil exists in the world. That's that's not a, a miracle of God. The miracle is if I can see that evil exists within me. And that that evil can be forsaken. And so when the focus is always upon the other people who have done wrong and the condemnation of others as a justification for your own actions, then you're not of God. And that's what we have to address in ourselves. That's why God is giving us this light. You know, it's, it's not for some intellectual, you know, puzzle as much as those can be enjoyable. Right. He didn't give us this light so that we could have, you know, our intellect, you know, satisfied in some way. You know, you know, even with all these dates and numbers, you know, I'm dealing with this guy who, you know, has all these dates every 1260 days that are really unconnected. I mean, in his mind, they're connected. And and he believes that this makes him a prophet. And yet he doesn't really have a message. I mean, I can't, couldn't figure out what his message was. I kept asking him, well, what's the message? Well, the message is that I'm the watchman. You know, I'm appointed by God to be a watchman. And, and if you don't accept that I'm a watchman, then you've rejected the Holy Spirit. And I'm like, well, you know, the, I don't see it, anything that you're saying that makes sense. You know, it might mean something to you. That's fine. But you, there's no prophetic message that, that comes from it that I have to listen. And of course he has dates way off in the future, you know, 2034 and so forth, you know, using some of the same tools that we use, you know, Hebrew numbers, symbols and so forth. But we know that that's, that doesn't mean anything, right? You know, we can, I could have all my birthday, my children's birthdays line up at, you know, seven different way marks or something like that. Does that mean you have to listen to me? Right. It wouldn't mean anything. It doesn't. None of us are prophets. You know, we don't have a gift of prophecy, of authority for the church. None of us are leaders. Right. We're students. We're studying together. And, you know, if anybody ever says, well, because Theodore said it, it must be true. But we're just going to follow Theodore. That would be ridiculous because. If we're not individually understanding the scriptures for ourselves and being led individually, we're going to be in danger no matter who we follow, even if that person is teaching the truth. So, you know, we need to understand these scriptures. And I believe that God is giving us light on these scriptures. But it's up to each person to study these things and decide for themselves if they are true. But but at this point, I can't see that God has not led this movement. And I cannot see that God has not led Adventism. And, you know, and I've examined Advent ever since I became an Adventist, even before I became an Adventist. I took a critical, I, I always take a critical eye to everything, even to Adventism. And I read lots more about things against Adventist views than things in favor of Adventist views. Cause I, I want, I want to be correct. I want to know I'm not, I'm not a, an ideologue. You know, we need to know what what we believe is the truth. We need to examine it. We need to question things. But we know that God is consistent, that the experience that we have had with God in his word, as he gives us new light, it will strengthen our understanding. You know, we start on a path, right? We don't just have to close here, but, you know, we start off in a path. And, and, and I think about this as climbing a mountain. Now, You have to find a route to the top. Now, at first, you may not be sure that that route leads to the top, right? I mean, I mean, obviously it could, but you could take a wrong turn at some point. You may, you may go off a wrong path. It's hard to find a route up a mountain, especially, you know, some mountains are very difficult. 
Now there sometimes are you know routes that are sort of parallel to each other. They'll they'll get you to the top. But some are definitely more dangerous than others. But as you come towards the top, one thing you can be sure of is that the route that you took was correct, right? There's points along the way that you can know. I need to be here. I know that from here I can get to the top. I don't then question the route that I took. Was it the best one or not? I don't know if that's the best analogy. But God led you that far. He's not going to abandon you, especially when the top is in view and you know from where you're at that the top is attainable. Doesn't mean that you're going to take the the correct route from then on. You might take some other path that's going to lead you off. But you know, other people have been at that point and they made it to the top. And so you got there to question whether God was leading you or not along that earlier part of the route is kind of ridiculous god has been leading us he's continuing to lead us we can look back in the past and see other people that have been through this ground before we have millerite history we have adventist history we know that where we are is where they were and so we can be certain of the end of our journey it's all been prophesied before it's all happened and we need to simply follow god and continue to follow in his leading. Okay, so we'll come back to this in more detail. We're going to probably start drawing some of this stuff out on the line. So let's let's close with prayer. A dear, gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for the study this morning, for the things that you are teaching us. Help us to be receptive to the pleadings of your spirit and to see uh, the sin that lies deep within our hearts. You know, Lord, that we struggle in this world. There are so many disappointments, so many distractions, and uh, many trials that we must face. But we know, Lord, that you have a purpose and a plan. And as we uh, proceed towards that holy city, we ask for your continued guidance and strength, that light we can have for our feet, and the assurance uh, that just as you have led us in the past, you will continue to lead us. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.